Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. It has now been 76 years since India achieved independence from British rule. On this day in 1947, India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru raised the Indian national flag at the Red Fort in Delhi a few hours after delivering his iconic tryst with destiny speech. Now when it comes to India's freedom struggle, most of us have grown up reading or listening to stories like the ones about the Dandi March, the Swadeshi movement and the Champaran Satyagraha. But there are many other stories about India's independence movement that were not included in our school textbooks, the ones a lot of us still haven't heard about. So to hear such stories in this special episode of the Three Things podcast, we speak to three historians about their favorite tales from India's freedom struggle. And we begin with historian Mridula Mukherjee, who was a former professor at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Well, India's freedom movement was an epic struggle. It had all the characteristics of a very dramatic movement. It was uh, almost 100 years long. Many battles were fought uh, during the course of this long struggle. Starting in the mid-19th century, we went all the way till 1947. And uh, however, I think one of the most important things about this movement was that it was based on active participation of the common people of india and one of the striking features of this uh, movement is that uh, many young people participated in it from school and college students to workers and peasants she says the average age of those who participated was very young and so one of the things that i would like to talk about is how in the course of these mass struggles some of the major ones which were led by gandhi ji for example the non cooperation movement 1920 to 22 or the civil disobedience movement 1930 to 32 or the quit india movement in 1942 which uh, involved the people in their millions in actual uh, street level action and uh, lakhs of people went to jail hundreds and thousands suffered privations of various kinds So this aspect is what I'd like to illustrate and how there was a lot of innovation in the movement by the ordinary people. Once the basic program was laid out which is civil disobedience, break the law or non-cooperation, don't cooperate with the British, boycott schools, boycott colleges, boycott the law courts, protect the honor of the flag, make salt as defiance, don't pay chokidar tax, don't pay land revenue. But within that, how people actually translated these programs into everyday action is what fascinates me. And to illustrate this, she gives examples from what happened during the Anti Simon Commission movement of 1928, also referred to as the Simon Go Back movement. An all white Simon Commission was being sent to India in order to decide whether India was ready for another dose of constitutional reforms or not. And people in India were very angry that how can a body of Britishers decide what we need or what we want? Is not a single Indian eligible to be a member of this body? So they decided that they would go to boycott this commission. So when they landed in Bombay from that time wherever they went Bombay Madras Lucknow Calcutta they went all over the country the nationalist forces and especially a lot of young people would organize boycotts of this commission in various kinds of ways usually it would be they'd hold big meetings they'd show black flags to them when they arrive at the station shutters would be down shops would be shut a hartal would be conducted you know various kinds of things happen but when the couple of very interesting incidents about how people thought that they could make the boycott more dramatic the simon commission under the chairmanship of sir john simon was bound to travel from bombay to pune in a train and so she says that one group of young students decided that it wasn't just enough to show them black flags when they arrived in pune and they figured that you know there was this stretch from lodavla to pune where the rail track was parallel to the road and within sight of each other so they decided to hire a lorry and a large number of them got into that lorry with black flags on which was written go back simon 
and then they drove this lorry all along the train and while the train was on the rail track and they were on the road and they followed it all the way to pune so you know whatever it was an hour two hours the simon commission had to actually look at these young guys across who were driving along showing them black flags and obviously having a lot of fun in the process and that's the other thing about it that you find that when you talk to people who participated in this movement they're always talking about how much they enjoyed it they didn't see it as a pain in the neck they took it as a duty but a joyful duty you know not something which was like uh, some kind of heavy on you you know it was something you did because it had to be done and you enjoyed doing it the other example from the simon gobat movement comes from lucknow where the local landlords who were british loyalists were holding a reception for the commission in an open area in kaiserbag so what the local leadership over there especially the young people there decided that they had to think of some ways of disrupting this uh, reception and making it uncomfortable for them so they thought of this idea that they would fly kites over that reception so they'd have to go in disrupt you know so they got kites and wrote simon go back on the kites and then large numbers of these kites were flown in a manner that they covered the sky above the kaiser bag so while this grand reception of loyalists was going on the sky was full of simon go back kites it was protests like these which took place almost wherever they went that made it clear to the simon commission that the public opinion was against them it was not just that when they landed or big towns wherever they went they met these so obviously it had an impact and the important thing was that their recommendations became infructuous because who could take them seriously when india nationalist india has completely boycotted it they refused to even come and talk to you so it's very obvious that you're only going to talk to loyalists you're not talking to the people who are actually fighting for a more democratic form of government so what's the point in all this constitutional exercise Now the other set of stories she told us were from the civil disobedience movement which took place 2 years after this and which began by the famous dandi march by mahatma gandhi So in this movement one of the very interesting things uh, that we find and especially young people were involved in was to save the honor of the national flag and we have a spate of very interesting anecdotes incidents some of them very heroic a lot of repression was used on people but how people very bravely took so much repression in order to save the honor of the flag the first incident she mentions involves a group of young girls in surat who got together to raise flags outside their houses but some police thought that this was not to be allowed even young children doing this was a defiance of british authority so they snatched the flags away from them so these little girls came back uh, crying and uh, said to their mothers and their aunts that you know this is what had happened and how the flag had been taken away and what were they supposed to do and they were dejected so then the idea came to some of the women they went to the local khadi store bought khadi dyed it in the colors of the national flag stitched dresses for the girls of those the cloth which was dyed in these three colors the girls then wore those dresses and then started marching up and down with total impunity because you know what could you you couldn't take away their clothes from them you know so this was the way in which these little girls who called themselves the cat army defied the british by wearing the national flag on their bodies but far more serious incidents also uh, happened in different parts of the country where people paid very heavily for what they did one was in uh, kerala p krishna pille who later became a major communist leader who suffered severe lathi blows when he stood with determination to not let the flag be taken away from him an even more famous incident was on the andhra coast at a place called bundur where tota narsai and aidu who became very famous for this incident later he preferred to be beaten unconscious by a 15 member police force rather than give up the national flag she says that these were the kind of stories that would slowly spread and inspire other people as well in a small village in gujarat for example i recall again the same thing was happening the national flag would be snatched away by the police so again uh, one very ordinary person you know from a very disadvantaged 
agricultural background, thought of this, ran away with the flag, swam a long distance in a pond, kind of a small lake, went to the middle of the pond and on a little mound over there went and hoisted the national flag and said, now come, come, can you come and take this flag away? So if the police wanted to come and do it, they'd have to swim, (laughs) wade through water and swim to that place. So I find this fascinating because, you see, in addition to the big dramatic events like the, the salt march, Gandhi's defiance of the salt law, Jawaharlal Nehru's defiance of this law or that law and the big leaders who participated. It was the millions of small mutinies like this which actually went into the making of this movement and which is what made this movement irrepressible. And this was again a very interesting feature of the national movement. At the top level, only the broad contours would be laid out. And there was enough space for innovation, but within discipline. And I think this is what really made this movement what it was. Now, after talking about the small individual acts of revolt against the British, we bring you the story of one man's grand and radical rebellion. This story is told to us by A.R. Venkatachalapati, historian and professor at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. So I want to focus on a story that is uh, largely, if not completely, unknown to the rest of India. This is a legendary story in Tamil Nadu, but outside Tamil Nadu, very few people know it. This story is about V.O. Chidambaram Pillai, a freedom fighter who was born in the port town of Tutikorin in 1872, around the time when the Swadeshi movement was growing into prominence. The professor tells us that Pillai became prominent because he did something that was truly spectacular. When during the Swadeshi movement, people were, you know, making uh, Swadeshi buttons, uh, Swadeshi chalk pieces, Swadeshi matches, this man decided to launch a Swadeshi steam navigation company. A shipping company, essentially, which was to become India's first indigenous one. In the 19th and early 20th century, the British ruled the seas. When I say they ruled the seas, it didn't just refer to their naval might. They were an even more important and more powerful mercantile marine power. So between the British India Steam Navigation Company and the Peninsular and Oriental Company, they practically had the entire world's freight and passenger traffic in their control. He says that as far as the Indian Ocean was concerned, the British India Steam Navigation Company had a monopoly over the delivery of mail in the region, which covered almost the entire cost of operations. And uh, the indentured labour that went from India to all over the world, the figures that we have is that something like 40 million Indians went out as indentured labourers between 1840 and 1940. So to just to give an idea of what these numbers are, these are four times the number of slaves who were sent from the Western African coast to America during the height of the transatlantic slave trade. He says that the British India Steam Navigation Company practically ruled the seas and hand in glove with the South Indian Railways also ensured that a lot of small ports along the southeastern coast got shut down. So that only three or four ports were functional and all the goods would be carried by the South Indian Railway to these major ports. You know, the other aspect of this trade was that the British agents, the British shipping companies, they treated Indian traders shabbily. He says that putting it mildly, it was a story of daily humiliation. Local traders had to suffer consistent indignities at the hands of the British. So 1906, Chidambaram Pillai, who was a small-time lawyer in the port town of Tutikorin, decided to mobilise local traders and start a shipping company with a shared capital of 10 lakh rupees. So he mobilises the traders, but this is a huge sum, right? 10 lakhs. So he is part of the Swadeshi movement. This is not a commercial enterprise for him. This is a nationalist enterprise. So he begins touring all over South India, raising money. And, you know, he was a fantastic... uh, Orator. In fact, he is said to be one of the earliest Tamil public speakers 
So wherever he went, he was able to or speak to people and he could get ordinary people to contribute small sums of money. He was also a follower of Lokamanya Tilak. So he belonged to the extremist camp of the uh, Indian National Congress. So he builds up not only raises capital, basically he says Swadeshi propaganda all over uh, South India and he is able to, you know, raise substantial capital. The next step, of course, was to actually buy ships for the company. And considering that he was up against one of the most powerful navigation companies in the world, this task was not going to be easy. But he met the challenge head on and decided to buy not one, but two ships. Now, how do you buy a ship? You can't go to, you know, Lulu supermarket or uh, Dilgiri supermarket and buy a ship off the shelf. So this is a small time pleader who is, you know, dreaming these kind of big things. So uh, in those days, shipping was uh, like now, it was an international uh, business. So he makes contacts in Bombay and then he gets some people to go to France and he ends up buying two ships at the cost of one ship costs two and a half lakhs and another ship costs one and a half lakhs. He says that Pillai was challenging the British on their own ground and in 1907 brought the new ships to the port of Tutikorin. So throughout 1907, he is able to seriously challenge the uh, British uh, company. And he says that at this point, the British government, which was supposed to have a free trade policy, actively began to intervene in this competition. So the British company tries all kinds of ruses. You know, they cut down on fares, they give uh, freebies, they hire goons, they uh, slap false charges on uh, the employees of the Swadeshi company. You know, they try to do everything to wreck the company, but uh, these people, you know, Chidambaram Pillai holds on and continues his work. In fact, he says that Pillai later started organizing Swadeshi movements, where he openly challenged the British. And that is when the administration decided to crush the movement. So, from 1908 January to the first weeks of March 1908, for about 8 to 10 weeks, South India, the southern part of Tamil Nadu is agog with Swadeshi activity. And finally, what they do is they arrest and uh, following the arrest, there is a huge uprising in, uh, in Thirnal Valley and Tutukurin. These, twin t- these two towns near each other, there is public violence, public pot- protest, and then uh, it is quelled with firing. And Chidambaram Pillai is charged with sedition. And four months later, is punished under the British law and sentenced to two back-to-back life sentences. And this draconian sentence bothers John Morley as well, the then Secretary of State, who says that this was going too far. And so when Pillai appealed the sentence in the High Court, it was reduced to six years. But in the prison, he is treated with the utmost uh, cruelty. He is made to pull the oil mill. The oil mill is something that has to be pulled by two draft animals. You know, two bullocks have to uh, turn the oil mill. But they make this one man do it. They try to break him, crush him. So meanwhile, once he is in prison, they are able to successfully crush the Swadeshi Steam Navigation Company. It tries to survive for the next two years, but with no strong leadership. And, you know, the entire mood of fear that the government has uh, implanted in the people. The company comes, stops by about 1910 and the company is liquidated in 1911. So for me, this is one of the great uh, stories of uh, idealism and uh, enterprise and uh, self-sacrifice. He says that he himself was inspired by this story when he was 14 years old and has been researching Chidambaram Pillai for the past 40 years. He says that this story has shaped him as a student and as a teacher of Tamil history. The larger story, I would say, is, of course, the first of all, the Indian national struggle, the Indian freedom struggle, is a struggle that made what India is. And the ideals of that struggle is what is still kind of a bulwark against the kind of religious and communal polarization is that is haunting our country now. So that is 
the second is for a long the what the colonial period did to indians the colonialism kind of stopped us from dreaming big it instilled in us a great amount of you no know, lack of confidence with the sowed seeds of self doubt in us about what we can do and i think even 76 years after indian independence there are so many obstacles to thinking big and i think chidambaram pillai story is more than 110 15 years after this uh, uh, you know the grand uh, project that he undertook i think it is still inspirational it is a uh, inspiration for indians to think big dream big not worry about uh, the apparently insurmountable obstacles hearing stories about india's independence movement gives us a peek into how the country came into being so to understand it even further we should look at it right from the beginning when we spoke to author and historian swapna little she spoke to us about the revolt of 1857 which is often called the first war of indian independence a mutiny which engulfed large parts of the country and saw thousands coming together to oppose british rule now when we often when we talk about 1857 we talk about various rulers we talk about rani lakshmi bai of jhansi we talk about avadh and begum hazrat mahal and we talk about delhi we talk about bahadur shah zafar all these people who are rulers of principalities kingdoms who are trying working to either win back or secure their possessions against british encroachments very often we don't ask ourselves what is it that the common people why were these i mean it was not just these rulers who rose up we know that the initiative that was taken was taken at a very popular level you know there are these we all know that the soldiers there had been this simmering discontent in among the soldiers and these soldiers with who mutiny in merat it is after the mutiny in merat that the uprising really breaks out she says soldiers were mutinying all over the country and they converged on delhi and declared the last mughal emperor bahadur shah zafar as their leader and you know you see it's very different from the mughal emperor taking the initiative and saying i am going to lead you and you come and join me it's these guys who are actually taking the initiative here and they are the ones who almost force bahadur shah to be their head and when you look closely at what is going on in delhi at that time you realize that it is not as if they have restored bahadur shah to be the emperor now he will rule as he wishes because what is actually happening is that the soldiers and certain citizens they put together what they call a court of administration This court of administration she says included ordinary citizens peasants and soldiers and these are people who have very different aspirations it's not simply a monarchy or an old style traditional kingdom or empire that they want to restore they are looking for the fulfillment of their demands also and many of their demands are about one is about overthrowing british rule because they see british rule as something that is exploitative british rule by this time it had become quite clear was um, something that you know taxes were going up land was being expropriated all those kind of things were happening which people realized uh, it was part of their lived experience soldiers you know they were very poorly paid they were made to fight in all sorts of far away places so they all had grievances so they are trying to overthrow this regime but what they are trying to put in place really is something that is quite different what they were trying to put in place many believe was based on democratic principles you know we take democracy so much for granted today but we must realize that that is an era of absolute monarchies these democratic principles the idea that these people are saying you know we must uh, be governed by a group that is selected from among us that's a very revolutionary idea really and the other thing that they are talking about is greater egalitarianism the revolt at least as it happens in delhi leads to a lot of redistribution of wealth there is some amount of looting 
you know, people who are relatively deprived, they get more wealth in their hands and that's leading to upward mobility for them. They are becoming soldiers, for instance, and they are now refusing to do menial jobs, etc. In fact, it leads to a, even at the level of the government, this independent government that has been set up in Delhi for four months, even at the level of the government, which has Bahadur Shah as its symbolic, at least head, there is a acknowledgement of this fact. So it's a very interesting thing that the Mughal emperor who was called Hazrat Jaha Pana Salama, which meant your exalted majesty, a order goes out to all the deputy Kotwals who are in the city, all the Thanadars who are in the city, saying that from now on, he will not be called your exalted majesty, but he will be called Garib Parvar Salamat, protector of the poor. And this was a radical shift in thinking. And it came about in an attempt to overthrow the British rule. Yes, of course, there are these rulers who are also seeking to restore and secure their territories, their kingdoms, etc., principalities. But there is also this element. And I think this element is what ultimately leads to a sort of national movement that we have, the freedom struggle that we have. And this is what um, really, you know, finds its embodiment in the new nation eventually, which uh, comes to pass in 1947. That dream that starts then is realized that the kind of values that our constitution, for instance, enshrines. The 1857 revolt we now know did not succeed. The British captured Delhi and then destroyed it, killing thousands in the process. But one wonders what would have happened had the revolt succeeded and the court of administration would have been put to order. Because that is when we would have seen the fruition of what these little signs were. But that unfortunately didn't happen. The revolt is suppressed. So we never get to that stage. And it is only in this moment of crisis that we are seeing little signs, but never the full flowering of it. And Little says that apart from these early democratic principles, with the revolt, a new identity came into being that was not regional and not connected to one's religion, ethnicity or language. Because if you see the proclamations that this government sends out and what it's doing is it is sending out proclamations to the soldiers and people all around the country saying, please come and join us. And they are saying that come and join us, whatever your religion whatever your ethnicity is, whichever place you are from. So it's calling on all sorts of people. And there again, you have an idea which is very, very significant, I think, because it is talking about an identity which is kind of a, I would say, a proto-nationalist. one. This is what is going to lead eventually to our definition as a nation. What is it that defines us as a nation? The fact that we think of ourselves as a nation, as one people. It's not these any sort of objective features of language or religion or something. It's what we come to think of ourselves as. And that is, I think, also a very, very important aspect of that movement that we see in 1857. A new national identity was being formed, one that did not exist before the British rule. Think about it. What were we? We were different principalities, different kingdoms, empires. You know, we often think back and retrospectively apply what we understand as a nation today back in history. And it's not just India that we are talking about. You know, this is a worldwide thing. Nations are a very, very modern phenomenon. They are not very old and therefore... uh, This process of people beginning to think that they have something in common that should bring them together. And this is why she says that Indian nationalism develops in the context of an anti-colonial movement. In fact, this very interesting newspaper editor called Mohammad Bakar, and he in his newspaper called Delhi Urdu Akbar, talks about this very interesting thing. In one piece, he writes that what the British have done is they have systematically looted the wealth of India and taken it outside. And that has not happened. And that's kind of very perceptive, actually, to realize that our objection to the British is not that they are outsiders. 
Of course, outsiders come. Sometimes they become insiders also. So it is not that you have an objection to the British on purely xenophobic grounds, that these are foreigners. You have an objection because this is an exploitative regime which is exploiting one nation or a nation in the making, whatever you may call it. One whole people, one whole land, it is exploiting and its wealth, it is transferring to another place beyond the seas. That is different. So you have this very sophisticated understanding now, which is taking shape of what colonialism is. So this whole process, and this has been studied a lot by historians, how in the Indian context, nationalism grows out of an anti-colonial movement also. You are listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.